Hello everyone, I'm Kevin Limanta. In this talk, I will be presenting my research called An Algebraic Interpretation of the Super Catalan Numbers. This is a joint work with my supervisor, Norman Wellberger. The main object of my talk will be the Super Catalan Numbers given by this formula. SMN is equal to 2M factorial times 2N factorial divided by M factorial, N factorial, times m plus n factorial for m and n non-negative integers. This number is always an integer, and this number generalizes the usual Catalan numbers, c sub n, precisely when m is equal to 1. Although there are many combinatorial descriptions of the Catalan numbers, to the best of my understanding, there is no general combinatorial interpretation of the super Catalan numbers. However, there, there are several attempts made by some mathematicians to describe the super Catalan numbers for some value of m and n. For example, if m is equal to 2, we have a description in terms of blossom trees by Schaeffer, cubic trees by Pipenger and Sly, or pair of dig pads with restricted heights by Kessel. Or if n is equal to m plus s for some s, we have a description in terms of restricted latest paths by Chen and Wen. We also have some weighted interpretations of the super Catalan numbers. For example, we can think of SMN as certain values of a certain polynomial called Krovchuk polynomial. This is a work by Georgiotis, Munemasa, and Tanaka. Or we can also think of SMN in terms of two Motskin paths. This is a research conducted by Alan and George Chichip. Here I will be giving you some values of SMN. As you can see, this table here is symmetric. And the first row, and in fact also the diagonals, they represent the central binomial coefficient. And as you can see, if m is equal to 1, the second row here, the second row here, they are the, the usual Catalan numbers multiplied by 2. OK, so here I will be attempting to describe the super Catalan numbers algebraically. And the main idea here is to describe SMN as some integral values. So I am attempting to integrate polynomials over unit circles over finite field. So I will be discussing the usual setup for this talk. So throughout, F will be a finite field with P to the R elements. So it's a well-known fact that any finite field must have some powers of prime um, elements. So here I will be restricting my characteristic of my field to be at least three. Um, we have this Fermat-like condition. So x to the q is equal to x for any x in the field. Okay. And here, if I have a symmetric matrix, which is invertible, uh, call it M, with entries in the field F, we can define an associated symmetric bilinear form on F2 by uh, u dot v is equal to u times m times v transpose. Okay, so, so every symmetric matrix M will give rise to a different geometry. So we define the associated quadratic form is to be um, q of v to be v dot v. And the unit circle in this setup will just be the set S consisting of all V in F2 such that the quadrants of V is one. Okay, so we are mainly interested in three different M's. Okay, so we have three matrices, I, J, and K. Every single one of them will give rise to a different geometry. So in, if M is equal to I, we have the usual Euclidean geometry which I will call the blue geometry. Here the quadrants is um, x squared plus y squared, 
So by definition, the blue unit circle, S sub B, will just be the collection of all X, Y, where X square plus Y square is equal to one. So this is the usual circle. But if M is equal to J, we have another geometry, which I will call the red geometry. And we have an, our red circle. And if M is equal to K, we have another geometry. I will call this the green geometry with quadrants um, X, Y. Okay, so I will have three different unit circles, which I will call S sub P, S sub R, and S sub G. Okay. Um, so we have this nice uh, observation that we can parameterize the, the green unit circle simply to be t comma t inverse for all non-zero t in the field. So by this um, parameterization, we can see, simply see that the number of elements on a, on a circle, on the green circle, to be q minus one. Um, similarly, for the red unit circle, um, we can observe that this parameterization is analogous to the usual rational parameterization. So this will be valid for all t except one and minus one, because where t, if t is one or minus one, will be dividing by zero, which is not allowed. But then every point on the unit, on the unit circle can be written as this form, except for one point, which is minus one comma zero. So the number of elements on the red circle will just be Q minus one as well. For the blue circle, again, we have this very, um, the usual rational parameterization. Um, here, we have to be aware of the fact that one plus T square must, uh, can be zero because we are um, working in one at field. So depending on whether minus one is a square or not, the number of elements on the blue circle will be either Q plus one or Q minus one. Okay, so here, let F be any polynomial in F alpha beta. So as I mentioned earlier, I am attempting to find an analog for the integral of f over the unit circle in its geometry. So the most natural candidate for the integral of f over s will just be this map. So f is mapped to sigma fxy for all xy in, uh, on a circle, s. So because of linearity, it is enough to find a formula of this, where f is just a monomial, alpha to the k, beta to the l. So a question that we can ask is that, is there another possible candidate? So we will try to model what we want from an, from an integral. So our quest for, our, for an integral formula will be modeled after what we know about the integral in the classical sense and this model given here. So let's try to define something. We will try, we will um, call this linear functional phi from the factor space of polynomials over F to the field itself. This is um, important. And we will call this functional circular precisely when these following conditions are met. For example, the first one is simply normalization condition that one is mapped to one. The second one is locality. Um, roughly speaking, this means that if your polynomial restricts to zero on the unit circle, then the integral of f should also be zero. Okay, and the third condition is invariance condition. So roughly speaking, this means that your integral should be invariant under rotation and reflection. So I will not be dwelling too much on the technicality here. So I won't be um, 
discussing much about like the mathematics involved here or the setup. But these um, three conditions make sense because these three conditions um, also are also the conditions that we observe from the usual integral in the classical sense, okay? Involving um, Riemann sum and limits, okay? But then since we are also modeling our functional um, from this model, we also seek another condition, which I will call periodicity condition. So phi satisfies this condition. So this is simply um, Fermat-like condition in this in this guise. Okay, so here I will be defining um, three linear functionals, which I will call psi sub p, psi sub r, psi sub g. Okay, these three uh, linear functionals. And note for psi sub p, we have a plus minus sign. Here the sign is plus if minus one is not a square the sign is negative otherwise. So we can simply observe um, that the three linear functionals given here are circular. And a perhaps slightly surprising fact is my next theorem, which means, uh, which, which says that in every geometry, if such a circular linear functional exists, it must be unique. Okay, so this is the uniqueness um, property. So I can simply say that the only circular linear functional in every geometry is this psi sub p or psi sub r or psi sub g. Okay, so let's have a look at some examples. Here, um, if my field is of size 11, then I can identify f as this minus five, minus four, minus three, up to five. So I have three different circles, S, P, S, R, S, G. So in particular, if I want to find psi sub P of alpha to the fourth, I can simply um, find the X component of um, every point on the blue circle and raise that to the fourth power and take the sum of everything. So here I have one to the fourth, minus one to the fourth, zero to the fourth, and then three to the fourth, minus three to the fourth, and so on. Okay, so here I will, I will be having um, 12 um, terms, and then because I am working in F11, this sum will take, will, will take value in F11. So if you, can, uh, if you take a sum, you will get minus one. So working modulo 11. And then, my second example, if your field is of size 25, then here um, I can identify F as simply A plus B omega, where A and B sitting in the prime field F5 and omega square is two. And this condition uh, is coming from the fact that the polynomial alpha square minus two is irreducible in F5 alpha. Okay, so we have this red circle, for example, it will have 24 points. So in particular, if I want to find size sub r of alpha square p square, I can simply use this formula. So I will have 24 terms. And if you do the calculation, you will find that the answer is minus two. Okay. So here, uh, an observation. If you have a, like say q, so p to the r, the bigger your size of the field is, the harder it is to, to sum. For example, here I have 24 terms. What if my field has, say, 107 elements? Then I will have 107 terms to consider. So um, it will be harder to take the sum to 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 find a, to take to take the sum of psi of r or psi of g or psi of p. So my next question is: Is there a nice formula for our three circular functionals? And the answer is yes, there is a nice formula. But as with um, everything, we cannot get um, everything for free. So there will be some conditions that we need to, satis to satisfy in order to have a nice formula. So to some extent, there is a nice formula. So 
let's actually have a look at uh, what I mean by nice formula. So for example, I have this theorem, uh, one of the many results. If minus one is not a square in our field and k plus l is less than or equal to q minus one, which is simply saying that the degree of the polynomial is at most q minus one, then I have a formula for psi of p, psi sub p. Here you can see that um, we have our super capital numbers, 2m factorial, 2n factorial over m factorial, n factorial, m plus n factorial, divided by some power of 4, where if k and l are even, and it's going to be 0 otherwise. And if minus 1 is a square, same degree condition, we have these three cases to consider. So mind you that this whole um, fraction, rational number, will take place in um, f q. So you can think of this simply as um, modulo, sorry, modulo q, which is p to the r. Okay, and it makes sense because we, we are not dividing anything by zero because here m, n, and m plus n, um, we are not dividing anything by zero. You can observe that here. Okay, so it's well defined. This value is well defined. Okay, um, so ha let's have a look at uh, the green geometry. So here we have the, for, uh, the following result. If such a circular functional phi exists, then it must be unique. Moreover, I have this formula for say sub g. So the idea is actually simple. So assume phi exists, then by inference property, if we use this um, monomial f and this transformation h that preserves the symmetric bilinear form, then I have this um, equation. So this equation is true for any t in the field, as long as it is non-zero. So for example, in particular, if um, k minus l is not a multiple of q minus one, then phi of f will be zero, okay? So we, we just need to um, consider the case where k minus l is a multiple of q minus 1. So assume that k is equal to l plus lambda times q minus 1 for some lambda, then we are going to use the locality property. So this polynomial in particular will restrict to 0 on the green circle. So using locality property and linearity as well, I have this condition. Okay, so if I use, if I sub in um, k equals l plus lambda times q minus one, using periodicity, uh, I have the second line here, and then by this first equation here, I will simplify this psi, uh, phi of alpha to the l, beta to the l to be phi of one. But then by normalization, it's just one. So um, phi of alpha to the k, beta to the l is uniquely determined. Moreover, we can show that psi of t is circular, so we have this um, nice formula involving psi of t. Okay, what about the red geometry? So this is uh, our main result for the red geometry. So again, again if um, the degree is at most q minus one, then we have three cases to consider, okay? Um, the idea is like this. So we, we are working in the red complex numbers. So we are extending our field f to fj. So it consists of all z equals a plus bj, where j square is one. So here j is a formal symbol. So not an element of f. Uh, we can observe that fj is a cyclic group of order q minus one. Um, the actual, um, the, 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 the main idea is that this map, from the red circle to the green circle, defined by x comma y map to x plus y comma x minus y is actually a bijection. In fact, it is actually a group isomorphism, but we are not going to use that here. We are just going to use the bijection. So here we have what you call a change of coordinate from the red circle to the green circle. So if you expand the second sum, you get something like um, this in the third line. A scary looking triple sum. But then the nice thing about this is that I can represent psi of r as psi sub g. 
So I know because I know what happens in psi sub g situation, then I can find uh, form a formula for psi sub r. Okay, here we have three observations. First, psi sub g of this uh, monomial is one if certain condition is satisfied. Uh, this condition here to be exact. And then if k and l have different parity, then k plus l will be odd. So this equation will have no solution for a and b. And the condition that k plus l is less than or equal to q minus 2 forces lambda to be 0, and k plus l equals q minus 1 forces lambda to be minus 1, 0, 1. Okay, so um, the, the degree condition forces uh, lambda to be 0 or 1 or minus 1. So let's say because k plus l ha has to be even, let's say it's equal to 2, two times d. So if k plus l is less than or equal to q minus 2, then um, lambda is 0. So here, from this equation, I have a plus b is equal to d. So b is equal to d minus a. So I can replace b by, by d minus a. So I have a single sum here. And if I modify this single sum to, to this second sum, uh, I can realize the this sum here to simply be the coefficient of alpha to the k of this polynomial 1 minus alpha square to the d. So because um, every power of alpha from this expansion will be even, in particular if k is odd then this is zero, so size sub r of this will be zero. So we can assume that k is even, so say 2m, hence l is also even, say 2n, then we get our result by simply subbing um, k equals 2m and l equals 2n. Okay. So we had this formula. So a similar argument can be used for k plus l equals q minus 1. OK. Um, I will be quick here. So if now, for example, the geometry is blue, if minus 1 is a square, it's actually fairly simple. Um, we have these three cases as well. And the idea is actually um, not that hard. So because minus 1 is a square, there, there exists some i in the field such that i square is minus 1. So we consider the map from blue circle to red circle given by this x comma y is mapped to x comma y i. It is again a bijection. Um, so we have another change of coordinates from the blue circle to the red circle. And the result will follow. Okay, uh, It's going to be slightly harder if minus 1 is not a square. So here, the result is actually simple. We have only two cases. Um, so the idea is you extend your field because minus 1 is not a square to fi. So here in fi, which is simply a collection of what I call the blue complex numbers, z equals a plus bi, where i square is minus 1. It is actually, uh, actually isomorphic to f uh, q square. So the size of this field will be q square. This is a field. So if you define a map rho from the blue circle to the red circle, but mind you now, the underlying field for the red circle is fi, while the underlying field for the blue circle is f. So x comma y is also mapped to x comma y i, as seen in the previous proof. Uh, one, um, one observation is that rho of the blue circle is a subgroup of the red circle. Um, and I mentioned that this red circle is a cyclic group. Now the order of this row circle, the red circle is q square minus 1. So this row of the blue circle will be a subgroup of order q plus 1. So by fundamental theorem of cyclic groups, I can um, find a generator for row of blue circle. So if zeta is a generator for the, for the red circle, then zeta to the q minus 1 is a generator for the blue circle. So it's simply this set. So now our analysis, our computation of size sub p will be in fij. Okay, so here I'm replacing x by z plus z inverse over 2 and replacing y by z minus z inverse over 2j. And I have again these triple sums, but then as usual, uh, as before, I have three observations. I have this formula involving um, z to the power of something. It's simply a geometric progression, which is either one or zero. 
And again, um, if K and L have different parity, then this equation will have no solution. And K, the, the condition that K plus L is at most Q minus one will force lambda to be zero. So again, um, it's, a, it's very similar to before. Now we have some, some I and J um, scattering around, but it's the same um, analysis. Okay. So here, if we go back to our examples, say um, in, the, in the first example, my size of the field is 11. So minus one is not a square in field. So I can find size sub P of alpha to the fourth as simply um, this one. So one over four square times S two zero and it's, it's six over 16. And because we are working in um, modulo 11, so this six over 16 is just minus one. And for example, if our field has 25 elements, then um, using our formula, we can get minus two over 16, but we are working modulo 25, so this is actually three. Okay, um, my, my, in my answer, it's minus two, but then three is equal to minus two in our field. Okay, so what's next? Well, um, if you notice, um, in every theorem, I assume this degree condition that k plus l is equal to, is less than q minus one. So if I make a li a, li a little table, a nice little table here, um, I know what's happening here, what I call the upper half sums. Okay, so if I know what's happening in the lower half sums here, I can simply uh, extend this table using periodicity condition, right? If I know the whole um, square, the whole value in this square, I can simply copy and paste this uh, values so that I can find um, psi of alpha to the k, beta to the l for like any big k or big l, okay? So what's happening? So it, it's a question to ask, like uh, what's happening in the lower half sum? And unfortunately, the lower half sum is a different piece to conquer. Um, the analysis is slightly harder to, to, to do. So that's what I meant by um, like a nice neat formula can be seen if you are working in the upper half sum, but may not, maybe not so much in the lower half sum, okay? And this whole theory, because we are now able to integrate polynomial over unit circles, uh, this lets us do finite field for analysis differently. So the usual story, if you have a function, um, usually the function will be coming from uh, prime field f, f sub p to the complex number, but then this c is a, is a complex number field in the classical sense. It's coming from the real numbers. But then we can actually do Fourier analysis if we consider functions from say the blue circle to the complex extension of f, so fi. So the value is um, in fi, or you can say, okay, function from red circle sr to um, fj, the complex number analog, or from sg, the green circle to fj as well, because uh, we can actually go from red to green, vice versa, quite easily. And actually, this S sub G is isomorphic to F star, so we can actually think of this as, you know, uh, working in, uh, in the finite field itself. Another question to ask is, uh, what if your field is of characteristic zero? So this is another interesting question that um, I'm considering. Okay, um, unfortunate, unfortunately, due to time restriction, I will have to stop now. Thank you so much. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.